Today on Let the Bible Speak. Not only do people have a tendency to drift, so do churches. Are you part of a drifting church? Find out next. And it's my joy to be with you today for a time of Bible study and investigation. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. If something is not anchored, it will invariably drift. This is not only true with the boat, it's true in our lives, and it's true when it comes to the church. An old gospel song likens the church to the old ship of Zion. And that metaphor certainly works because the Christian life is implicitly and explicitly referred to this way in the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews was concerned about Christians abandoning the faith and turning back to Judaism. He challenges them to stay true to the course they had set out upon in Hebrews 2 verse 1 using a nautical term, saying, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Well, The word slip is rendered drift in the New King James and other translations, and It refers to something being carried downstream away from its original place. This is what happens in many a life, and it's also the story of religion over the past 2,000 years. And it is what is happening to many congregations of the Lord's church today. I want us to think together about a drifting church. Are you part of such a church, and how can you tell? Stay with me for our study. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. I stand in awe that Jesus died on Calvary. I stand in awe that He hung there just for me. And that He bled.
Christians to whom the Hebrew letter is addressed were under the increasing temptation to renounce the faith of Christ and return to the sacrifices and ordinances of the Old Testament. The inspired writer repeatedly emphasizes the inadequacy of those things and the superiority of the things found in Christ Jesus. The fateful decision to turn away from the truth was not something that would happen all at once. It never is. It was a gradual process. A building doesn't fall into a state of neglect and disrepair overnight, and neither does a soul, and neither does a church. It happens over time. Thus the apostle admonishes them to be diligent and not let the truth slip away from them. He says, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now the word slip means to drift away. In fact, that's how it's rendered in the more modern translations. This verb can have several shades of meaning. It was sometimes used in classical Greek as a nautical term, meaning to drift or float away, like a boat that is not securely tied and slips away and drifts along with the current. It can also mean to take a wrong course. Now the metaphor is clear that when one is not careful and paying close attention, we can drift away from the truth. Notice that the truth doesn't drift away from us, but rather we drift away from the truth. The truth doesn't drift because it is fixed and unchanging. Psalm 119 verse 89 says, forever, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So if we become removed from the truth, it was us who moved and not the word of God. The truth of God does not change with the times. It does not wax and wane in power. It is not bendable and pliable to fit whatever times or circumstance we may find ourselves in. You see, the truth is always the same. And if we become separated from it, it is only because we were carried away from it by the currents of life. It is possible, and in fact, more times than not, it is the case, that people drift slowly and unconsciously. If you're out on a boat on some large body of water and you're not anchored or tethered to something that doesn't move, well, you'll drift. And it usually takes some time to realize just how far you've gone. If you don't have a fixed point of reference, but you merely look at the surrounding water or you merely look inside the vessel, well, you'll not realize that you've drifted, sometimes until it's too late. That's the way it is when we drift morally, spiritually, and theologically. We become so accustomed to the culture of sin until it doesn't seem quite as bad as it used to. Or changes in doctrine occur so slowly, so insidiously, that we don't realize how lax and liberal we have become when it comes to the teachings of the Bible. Or we little by little become lackadaisical and careless about spiritual things until we simply don't realize how worldly and full of apathy we have become as Christians. Well, this verse here in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 does not mention some heinous or shocking sin that has suddenly been committed, but rather careless, thoughtless, and gradual drifting. What's the difference between many a teenager who takes his first drink and a bleary-eyed drunk laying in some gutter? Time. What's the difference between some person who allows themselves to compromise some moral standard when they defy their conscience in some matter, and then the person who embraces things that most would have seen as shocking a few years ago? What's the difference? Time. What's the difference between the person who begins to neglect the church services now and then, and the person who starts to get too busy to attend to the duties and the responsibilities of Christian life, and then the person who has left the faith altogether? The difference is time. It's simply a matter of gradually drifting over a period of time. It takes no effort to drift. The Hebrew writer takes this picture from the vast ocean where powerful underwater and often unseen currents are at work and the vessel drifts along with them. And that's the way it is in life. And so it is with the church as well. There are always powerful currents at work threatening to take the church away from the established truths of God's Word and from those doctrines and practices revealed by the apostles into uncharted territory. There were the Judaizers, there were the Gnostics, there were various factions and groups and people that arose even in the first century to draw away, as Paul one time said in Acts chapter 20, disciples away from themselves and away from the truth. As a result of these currents, the old ship of Zion sometimes finds itself drifting along with them 
and moves farther and farther away from the truth without realizing sometimes that that's the case. That's true in how and what the church preaches, what it practices, and even how its members live. How do churches drift? What are the reasons that churches drift with the tide of time, and how can we tell if that's the case? Well, first of all, I would suggest that when the Bible ceases to be the church's sole authority, well, that'll tell us that church is adrift. When we become less concerned about proving our beliefs and our practices by the Word of God, we're drifting. When we cease to be conscientious about that, we're drifting away from the principles of truth. You know, there used to be a time not that many years ago when people firmly held to doctrinal convictions because they earnestly believed that the Bible taught those things. It used to make a difference to people what the Bible actually said or where the Bible was silent about a practice. People at least made the effort to go to the Word of God and to see if their practice was true and they would contend for that practice if they believed it was true. Today though, in the name of ecumenicalism or union, people now think it really doesn't make any difference what the church practices. Churches of Christ have long been known as a people who demanded book, chapter, and verse for what we believe and what we do. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good, said Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. And in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, he wrote, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Peter reminded us that we're not permitted to go beyond what the Scriptures teach when he said, If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. That is, let a man speak only as God has already spoken. So we can't go beyond or fall short of what the Word of God says. We have to use the Word of God as our guide in all matters of faith and practice. Now simply put, how do we know if a church is abiding in the truth? How do we know if it's practicing the truth and not error? And whether or not it is contending for the faith once delivered to the saints? Well, only by comparing what it believes and what it practices by the Word of God. It's that simple. We don't measure a church's loyalty to the truth by church tradition or popular opinion or humanly written creeds because all of those things change themselves over time. And there are so many in existence, which one do you believe to start with? Now today, the standard in many churches is no longer what does the Bible say, or uh, does the Bible teach this by explicit statement, by approved example, or even by necessary inference? But rather we've begun to ask questions such as, does it get the job done? Do people like it? Is it popular? Does it draw people in? Does it bring a big crowd? Does it feel right? Does the majority of the church agree with it? You see, these become the standards instead of what does the Bible say? And if we held ourselves strictly to that standard, I think we would shockingly find a lot of things that are going on in the religious world today don't come from the Bible. They're the result of human ideas, human innovation, human tradition. Folks, if the Bible does not authorize it, the church has no business doing it. We're Christ's subjects. We, he possesses all authority in His kingdom. The church is His to govern as He sees fit, and He governs it through the teaching of His inspired apostles. In other words, the New Testament, and therefore we're admonished to remain within the parameters, parameters of the things that they wrote. Long ago, the prophet Jeremiah said, Stand ye in the way, and seek, and ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. You see, the people then were at a crossroads, and they could either choose the path that would lead them to the unknown, or they could choose the old paths that were laid out long ago and walk in them. Unfortunately, they, re unfortunately, they refused to walk in the paths of old, and so have most churches today. Friend, listen to me. Is your church changing? Is it becoming something you no longer recognize? Is the preacher or are the elders changing their tune and basically saying, well, you know, we just don't think those things matter anymore? Are they embracing practices and trends that made you uncomfortable just maybe even a short time ago, perhaps that you never would have imagined a few years ago? Well, the, the truth doesn't change. God's standard doesn't change. The Lord's pattern for the church as revealed in the New Testament doesn't change. Rather, times change, and unfortunately, people change along with them and drift with the tide. Now, when your church starts to drift, where will it end up? That's a question that we should be willing to face. If the church starts to embrace unscriptural innovations, where does it stop? When that becomes the mindset and the trajectory of a church, 
Do you really think it will stop where it is now? Well, of course it won't. I meet people sometimes who ask, what's happening to churches of Christ? I'll tell you what's happening. The spirit of change and innovation is at work and has been at work and it will continue to be at work if people don't stop it and start demanding of us, say of the Lord. Many churches of Christ have simply become a denomination or a community church with very few doctrinal moorings and very few convictions. They're embracing things that they flatly opposed just a generation or two ago. And in many cases, those changes subtly and insidiously started some time back with gradual compromises with error. Those churches are adrift. And perhaps you're part of a church that is drifting. We need to wake up and realize what is happening before it's too late. Second of all, when the pulpit fails to fulfill its purpose, the church will drift. You know, the pulpit is to be a place of not only encouragement and edification, it's to be a place of sound doctrinal teaching and admonishment. Paul's charge to the younger evangelist Timothy was simple and straightforward. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Why, Paul? He says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but rather after their own selves will they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they will be turned away from the truth and unto fables. You see, Paul says the pulpit is to be a safeguard against apostasy and error. He says, preach the word. You can't dance around the truth and sugarcoat the truth and avoid preaching the truth and expect people to remain within the truth. Now some people don't believe that the pulpit should be used to expose error and warn against error. Well, you can just mark it down. A church that adopts such a philosophy will become, if it already has not, will become a drifting church. When a pulpit becomes a place for vapid pep talks and motivational speeches and psychology and politics and feel-good devotionals, and not a place where the meat of God's Word is taught and where souls are challenged to truer, holier, and godlier living, that will quickly become a drifting church. Does your preacher preach sermons that are soaked in Scripture? Or are they just merely filled with personal anecdotes and poems and statistics and stories? Is he willing to call sin by its name? Is he a watchman on the wall crying out against those things that can lead souls astray and endanger them? You know, in Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 26, Paul told the Ephesian elders in his meeting with them at Miletus, he says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He warned that wolves would enter in among them and ravage the flock. And he said in verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now a church will generally never be any stronger than the teaching it receives on a regular basis. We all like to be encouraged. We all like to be made to feel good. We all like to see the rosy side of things. But if that's all a church hears, that church will drift from the truth. The fact is, whether it's popular or not, a preacher or a leader is under a solemn charge from the Lord that he will give an account to the Lord for one day, and that charge is to preach the Word. Sometimes, as unpleasant as it may be, sin needs to be condemned. Sometimes, regardless if people get upset and leave, error must be pointed out, and souls must be warned. And you can measure whether a church is drifting by what's coming out of its pulpit. Number three, churches drift when they forget what they're here for. When they lose sight of their God-given mission, they will lose their focus and drift. Why does the church exist? You know, it's a question that we need to remind ourselves of and answer on a regular basis. Why does the church exist? Why did Christ set up His church to exist in the form of local congregations throughout the world? Just what are we here for? Are we just here to come together and worship, as important as that is? Well, no. You see, a church that is in line with the will of God exists to hold out the light of truth in the community where it exists. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16, "...holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain." Now that, that's the church's posture in its community, according to Paul, to hold forth the word of life. Friend, the church is not a political organization. The church has nothing to do with politics. The church is not here to engage in political or social activism. 
But that's what many consider their church to be all about today. That's what some preachers are all about today. That's not what the church of the first century was about. Christ didn't institute the church to eradicate poverty, to enact social equality in the world, as important of a thing as that is. He did not uh, institute the church to get certain people elected to office so they can affect a political agenda. It's not the church's job to make the world a better place to go to hell from. It's the church's job to preach Christ and Him crucified and to uphold and defend the truth of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul says, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto all them that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The church is not a business. It is not here to raise money or make money. It's not here to sell things. It's not here to provide entertainment and recreation for kids or anybody else for that matter. The church is here to preach the gospel, to save the lost, to edify the saved by functioning as a body, to edify and build itself up ultimately by the Word of God. That's the mission of the church. And any church that forgets that has drifted. I see church campuses and facilities today that speak rather loudly to the fact that those churches are in some other business besides just preaching the Word of God. What does a fitness center have to do with preaching the gospel? What do baseball leagues have to do with teaching the Word of God? What do festivals and parties have to do with training disciples in the doctrines of the Christian faith? Now don't misunderstand. I'm all for Christians being together and getting together, and I'm not opposed to people as individuals having wholesome fun in the process. But that's not the business and the mission of the church. Resorts, clubs, and condominiums dotting the seacoast don't save endangered ships. Lighthouses do that. The church and the truth it preaches is a lighthouse. It's not here for looks. It's not here to host a party. It's here to reach out and save those who are drowning on the sea of sin. It's not a social club, and many people need to learn that. Friend, is your church drifting? Is it drifting because it is no longer anchored to the rock of ages, but is adrift on the sea of change and endless transition? The church that drifts will lose its relationship to Christ because Christ will not drift with it. The church that drifts like the churches of Asia Minor in the book of Revelation will spiritually die. That's the fate of a drifting church. It will meet the rocks of doom. The church is drifting today, and we need to stop it before it's too late. Soon I'll enter the portals of glory. I'll enjoy all that's waiting for me. For me. Oh, but God can compare to the moment when the face of the Master I see. I see. When Oh
Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts, plus extra videos including Let the Bible Speak classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. If there was ever a time in the modern church when Christians need to stand up and be counted and say along with the prophet Jeremiah, stand ye in the way and seek and ask for the old paths wherein is the good way, well that day is surely today. We're drifting. We're drifting away from the core principles of the gospel, from the doctrines contained in the faith once delivered unto the saints, from Christian living, from the ideals of godliness and holiness that are set forth in God's Word. And it's time we return to a thus saith the Lord, and we hope that our lesson today will challenge all of us to do just that. If you'd like a copy of our lesson, we'll be happy to send it to you. It, along with everything we ever offer here on the program, is free of cost. We're not interested in your money. We're glad to send these materials to you to enrich your knowledge of God's Word. If you'd like a copy of today's lesson, be sure to ask for the lesson, A Drifting Church, and we'll get it on its way as quickly as we can. Thank you so much for joining me for the program. If we can assist you in finding the New Testament way, if we can assist you in finding a congregation of the Lord's Church that worships according to that pattern and preaches the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to hear from you. We'd be happy to do that. We hope that you'll make your plans to join me back here next time for another study of the Word of God and encourage someone else to do the same. Until then, I pray that you have a great week ahead, and may God richly bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.